high atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hey everybody, it's Mike Walsh, your solo host this week for Talking Catholic. My three beloved guest hosts are all in a world of busyness today. So uh, we're recording this on Thursday, March or February 25th, uh, right before we get to March. And uh, I wanted to have a special conversation with uh, someone who hasn't been on the podcast in quite some time, but this is her very busy time of year. Uh, something that all of our dioceses do in, in some capacity or, or another, certainly across the United States, they all have these like annual campaigns and they're called a number of different things. Sometimes they're named after the bishop. Sometimes they have a, a cutesy name that's created, but basically it's an annual fund that goes to support the work of the diocese and each diocese has it separated on a variety of different topics you know it, it might be something specific to a capital campaign might just be one thing or it might be a, a host of things in the diocese of camden where i am it's a it's a host of different things so um as my guest this week i wanted to bring in uh someone who manages that process and someone who's been a recipient of that process so the first person i'm going to announce first is katie cumberford rivera who is the Associate Director for Development for the Diocese of Camden. Her focus is specifically on the House of Charity, Bishop's Annual Appeal. Hey, Katie, how are you? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you? I, I By the way, I apologize. It has been so long that, since we've had you on again. I think it's been probably a year since you've been on last. And I feel terrible for the listeners because, you know, the last time you were on, and I think you've been on twice now, we, we talked a lot about uh, Marvel properties, which I'm a big fan of, and you have become a fan of because of your husband. Um, yeah. Why I had, Come to think of why I haven't had your husband on is really kind of a surprise. But uh, So I apologize <laughs> that we haven't had you on in a year, but you're always one of our favorite guests because you're so up. And it's not easy to talk about financial development and sound excited, and you do a great job of it. So, so thank you yeah. for joining me. Oh, absolutely. It's easy to be excited about it when you believe in it, Mike. You know, that might be the difference. I've, I've done financial development in years past for, for other entities, and it, it is a little harder to, to pitch when uh, it's not necessarily something you feel in your soul, but that's the benefit of working for the Catholic Church. We quite literally feel it in our soul, don't we, Katie? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And with Katie today is one of her favorite folks. Now, I will admit, you know, if you haven't been able to tell already, yes, we are doing this via Zoom, uh, not because we didn't want to get together. Actually, we were trying to figure out a way of doing it. But my schedule was literally so fractured, I just couldn't make it happen. So we had to do it to do it on Zoom. So joining us on Zoom today is um, Father John Picnic, who is the pastor of Christ Our Light Parish in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, who is also a returning guest that we had a great time with a few years ago. Father John, good to see you again. Oh, good to see you, Mike and uh, Katie. So glad to be on. Thank you very much. And, you know, I wanted to have Father John on because he's had a, uh, being a pastor, you sort of, you get two sides of the uh, the House of Charity goal or the, the House of Charity coin, which is on the one hand, you're a pastor. Generally, you get some benefit in your parish, um, depending on like how you raise your money and stuff like that. So he's, he's someone who has promoted it as well as seen the benefits of it. So uh, I thought that was a nice one-two punch. So, so Katie, I, I think I want to start with you. Um, just give a little description. Like I, I think I said earlier, you know, all these sort of annual appeals are a little different uh, from diocese to, to diocese. But what do we do in the Diocese of Camden? Yes. Yeah, so um, our appeal is the House Charity Bishop's Annual Appeal, and we support a variety of different ministries. So our goal is usually about $7 million, $7.8 million with COVID. We, we definitely lessened it a little bit this year, but we support Catholic charities, uh, Catholic education, um, hospital chaplaincy, which has been more important now more than ever um, with all that's been going on. Uh, religious education, youth and young adult ministry. So there's a lot of different areas that really rely on the House of Charity. And, um, you know, that's why it's, it's critical that we continue to run it each and every year. And how does the House of Charity actually work? Like, you know, what, what, are, the, what are the gears of the House of Charity? 
So we we could not do what we do without each and every parish. So the pastors, the volunteers, they are huge, huge, um, you know, and critical parts and pieces of the campaign. So Father John, you know how much I appreciate all that you do. You know, um, we need the parishes to raise their uh, money uh, within their parish to get us to this ultimate goal. So um, I would say it's it's very parish driven. And that's really the the sort of like the manner in which we run it in this in this diocese is as opposed to the diocesan offices necessarily putting out sort of a, a general call for um, support for the for the annual appeal. We really put a lot of the onus on the parishes themselves to do a lot of the um, promotion to their their parishioners, uh, and there's a benefit to that, right? Each each parish sees a benefit to that, not just in sort of general ministry, but actually some money comes back to the parish, right? Sure, sure. If uh, if a parish reaches their goal, they get 10% of whatever they, they collect. And then anything above their goal, they get 75%. So um, that is certainly an incentive to reach your goal. If a parish doesn't reach their goal, you know, they still do see that money. It's just not coming directly to the parish, but it does help their communities, um, you know, through the, the ministries that we support in their areas. Um, so, Father John, and, and you're, you know, I, I said you sort of sort of two sides of the coin for you. On the one hand, you got to pitch it. But on the other hand, you get to, to uh, benefit from it. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, when uh, when you first became a pastor, was this something, you know, working on the annual campaign, something you relished? Because I've met some pastors who don't necessarily re- relish the opportunity. Well, not that I was looking forward to it with great enthusiasm, <laughs> Uh, but I did realize it, it provides a lot of good, a lot of services to those who are in need. So that's really the selling point. It's not something just for us or something that we're going to get out of it. I know there's that 10% factor. If you do reach your goal, you'll get back 10%. That's always nice and it helps uh, with what we're doing through the year at the church at, or at the parish. Uh, but most people are fixed on... Um, you know, the services, the, the ministries, and the people that this can touch. So that is what kind of motivates me to do it every year. Um, and with COVID, you know, over the last year, it might affect a little bit this year. I'm hoping that that changes. Uh, there was, we saw a little bit of a decrease. We didn't make the goal uh, here or even at uh, Church of the Holy Family last year. So, but I'm praying that that changes and, you um, we had a good, pretty good kickoff weekend, and uh, we may have to do little reminders over the next few weeks because our weekend, it snowed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we didn't get as many, but we're publicizing it and uh, getting it out there. But maybe another weekend where we can just remind everyone and, you know, do little things like that to help bring that closer to goal so that we can provide those ministries and services to others in need. And, and Katie, you know, I, I kind of, in this conversation, I kind of want to lead this down sort of a best practices r- route because financial development is something that I think a lot of people have difficulty with when the subject comes up. I mean, yeah. th- there's a general sensibility that I don't want to ask my friend or my neighbor to, to support something. I don't even want to ask my family members to support something because I'm uncomfortable asking them to open up their, their wallet or their purse for something. Sure. Um, how do you, I've, I've had the benefit of working with you and your department for a long time now. And so while I, matter of fact, I've, I've used a lot of things that I've learned working in your department with other fundraising um, programs that I've worked with outside of the diocese. Um, so it's, you guys are a, a target rich best practices group, which is why I always enjoy talking to you. But, you know, in terms of the mindset of, of how you raise money, like how, when you're working with volunteers, how do you encourage them? How do you sort of like bring them on board? Is this is something that's worth your time and, and facing your fears? Sure. So uh, the first thing I would say is getting their buy-in in what we're trying to raise money for, because it's so important that if they're going to ask somebody for support, of you know this campaign or, or whatever they're raising money for, they need to believe in it because that truly shines through when you're talking to somebody about making a donation to something like this. 
So I, I first, you know, give them all the facts on how and why this is so important, right? And then, you know, the, the question is why or how can I ask somebody for, you know, this amount of money? You know, how, how can I possibly know that they can give at this level? And the one thing I always remind my um, volunteers is that this is not an arm twisting thing. It is all about just inviting them to make their own educated decision on whether they can give. So you're just giving them the facts. You're sharing why this is important and asking them to join you in essentially, you know, fundraising is ministry. So you're you're inviting them to, to join you in this ministry. And um, I think that's hard for, for some people to wrap their head around. Um, but once they do and they realize that it's just an invitation, and they're just allowing them to make their, you know, own educated decision. It is a lot easier um, because there's not supposed to be any forcefulness within, you know, your discussion. And you know, I think people have a hard time with that sometimes because they have this natural sure. feeling like, it, like I'm, I am going to have to twist somebody's arm. But the, the truth of the matter, that's that's not the case. Now, Father John, I mean part of being a pastor is being a fundraiser, whether you're raising money for the house of charity or for, you know, your own collection or your own, um, or your own appeals, you know, how have you found in your time, like any, I wouldn't go so far as call them silver bullets, but anything that works better than, than other things maybe when trying to encourage people to, to be comfortable asking their friends and family for support. Well, I, I think if you, I think House of Charity is actually the easiest one to sell because uh, you are targeting uh, those who are in need, poor, you know, the hungry, people who need places to stay. You can tap into everything. for. So if you took one of them, like Vitality, for instance, you could talk about the hospital chaplaincy and visiting the sick. Uh, you could talk about Stephen Ministry and this great support that they give uh, all around the diocese. Not only the parishes, but uh, you know, meeting one on one with folks. So those are real human interactions, and that's easy to pitch because people remember their own needs and they're saying to themselves, as we're showing the video, as we're giving the spiel up at the ambo, they can connect with that. Uh, when you start asking for projects. Uh, you know, if they can see that the roof is falling apart, then it, then it looks easier. Or if they see leaks every week. But if they see a roof, and even though we know it's not good, but they don't see the leaks and they don't see it falling apart, they're like, oh, they just want more money. You know what I mean? So I, I think the capital projects are a little a little tougher sell. Uh, increased giving. Uh, that one's got its advantages, disadvantages. You can always sell we're, we're bolstering the ministries of our own parish. Um, we want to keep the staff healthy and keep everybody on board. Those kinds of things uh, may work in that if you're asking for an increased giving campaign. Um, what happens is sometimes all three or four of those would, will converge. And that's what a pastor doesn't want at any cost. <laughs> and Katie <laughs> remembers this when we kicked <laughs> off Catholic Strong, because right around the pilot programs were going right around the same time as House of Charity. Uh, you know, so I had to sell that one. Then I had to sell the other one. And at the same time, I had to ask people to continue to give the same amount in their collection because you don't want to see the ordinary income go down. So you're, you're really uh, a salesperson in, in, in many respects. But uh, we managed, and I thought we did fairly well. Um, I think COVID threw us a curveball in all of those things. You know, the um, you know the ordinary income, the house of charity for last year, and maybe even a little bit this year. Catholic strong, maybe you might have set it back a little bit because we were going into the second year or third year, so it might have made people pull back because of the uh, economy. Uh, but I think as we begin to come out of COVID, those things will improve. Uh, I'm praying. <laughs> yeah, so you were a John. great. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. Go on. No, 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 no. Go ahead, say. I, I, go ahead, Katie. Oh, I was going to say he was an extremely good sport um, doing the Catholic Strong and House to Charity at the same time. I had the privilege of working with him when I was uh, a consultant for the campaign, and he was just you. You were fantastic, super positive, and um, it was it was a pleasure, truly. 
Yeah, so, I remember when you guys asked me to do the talk <laughs> in front of everybody. I'm like, oh, the old you walk. did so good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So I guess, you know, we should probably talk about that a little bit. So uh, for listeners from the Diocese of Camden, you might remember that we had this thing, Catholic Strong, which technically is still going on. It's a, it was a five-year program, uh, fundraising program, where we were asking people to give uh, specifically and, and much larger amounts than, than normal with the goal of, I think our goal was raising $50 million. Um, over the course of five years, which is still, I think we're still going into the, the we're in that uh, recoup time of, because uh, you were able to give a pledge of over however many years and, and that money will come in over time. I believe I am still paying towards my my Catholic Strong pledge. But so there's there's a massive um, fundraising effort. So let's say that that was $50 million a couple of years ago. Then you have the annual, the regular annual giving, which which typically is around $7 million. And then you have your collection. So that's three big, well, three, one normal ask, one annual ask, and one really big ask, which the truth of the matter is, and Father John is right about this, that sometimes that's difficult. I mean, we knew how difficult that was going to be asking uh, our parishioners to, to, inviting our par- parishioners to partake in something like that. And yet, all three ended up being very successful. So Father John referenced earlier, and I think you've referenced as well, that, you know, so House of Charity didn't do as well last year during the pandemic, during the, the, the throes of the pandemic. Um, but the truth of the matter is our goal was $7 million. But how much actually was raised, Katie? So for 2020, we raised $5.3 million. Okay, we raised $5.3 million in the middle of a pandemic. pandemic. Yep. All right. And let's be honest, at the same time, the Diocese of Camden also announced Chapter 11 about half of the way through because House, uh, House of Charity is an annual appeal, so it actually goes for an entire year where we're trying to raise money. But in the middle of a pandemic and the, House of, and the Diocese of Camden announces their chapter, their filing for Chapter 11, you still, I consider $5.3 million an incredible success when you consider you had that to go up against. So I would hope that, that the development department and the parishes don't consider that a failure. I think that that was phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. And it was um, it was so humbling, honestly, to run this campaign campaign during a pandemic, because I remember seeing we, we got a lot of online giving uh, donations because, you know, nobody was in the office. It was easier. So when I would look through the page and, and pull the gifts through, like there were some really big gifts or I would see that somebody had already made a gift. So I would call these people and just confirm, you know, um, that this was the donation they had intended to make. And um, many of them had had increased their giving significantly because they knew that there were people that couldn't make a gift um, that usually do. So it was a truly, um, it was, it was a nice experience to, to be able to talk to those type of donors, you know, that, that felt, you know, that they were lucky enough to have, um, the means necessary still during a pandemic. So, you know, giving it like somebody gave their stimulus check to us for, for a donation. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. The, um, I, so I, I, w- I wanted to give you guys credit because you would, you would each kind of, referred to that as missing a goal, but I personally think of that as achieving so much during a difficult time. But let's also talk about Catholic Strong a little bit too. And, and from the perspective of, of you know, a best practice. Um, so it's a $50, $50 million capital campaign, essentially, uh, specifically to go to new programs that uh, we were establishing from the diocesan level, but only 30% of the money of that money would actually go to diocesan programs and, and nothing that was old school. It was all going to be new programs that, that we were going to create with that money. The other 70% was going to go back to the parishes specifically for the parishes use. Now, from what we were able to tell from our, our contacts with your former employer, Katie, changing our world, who helped us run that campaign, um, that had never been done before, where a diocesan campaign, most of the money went back to the parishes. Mm-hmm. Very unusual, yeah. right? Like, what would a typical diocesan campaign, annual or a or major campaign, go? What would that breakdown usually be? Yeah, it would be the same, except uh, the seventy percent would go back to the diocese for for their programs, and then the thirty percent would go to the parishes. Sometimes even eighty twenty. 
Um, but in the diocese of Camden, we care more about the parishes than we do our own diocese. So we oh, give it the was money great. Back. Yeah. We were so excited to see it. It was. It was. We've uh, had like in my role as a director of communications, I've had more than enough, more than a few communications directors who also in their own diocese support their development departments say to me, they've never heard anything like that before, um, which I think actually probably helped us raise, you know, raise the, I think that that campaign at this point, it's a five-year campaign. So I think at that point, it's somewhere in the $40 million uh, pledged area. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, but I think that had a lot to do with it. The fact that the, that the campaign was intended to support parishes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Father John, you know, during that during that Catholic Strong phase, which I know we're still on, you're actually you are unique in the sense that you did Catholic Strong with your parish from a few years ago, Holy Family. And now you're in a new parish, which I'm sure has its own Catholic Strong stuff. Um, did you find that, Cap, you know, you said before you had, you know, it was a it was quite a task pitching both House of Charity and Catholic Strong. But I get the impression you were quite successful at it. So when I first got the letter and before Katie showed up in my office, uh, <laughs> the first thing I thought is, this is not a good time. Uh, but then when I met with Katie and I thought about it a little more and speaking with some of my brother priests, they were kind of of the same mind frame. It's not a good time. But then I realized it's never a good time. So you just got to do it. You know, it just got to happen. There was a need for it. Uh, I felt very strongly, uh, you know, I was in agreement with Bishop. It's got to be done. It's going to help us. It's going to help the diocese. Uh, whether you ask for it in January or you do it in June, you're always going to get people who don't want to do it, you know, because it's work. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, involvement. Uh, but now that I look at the fruits of it, I can see that the monies that were raised, especially at Holy Family and the things that we got done there, and the things they still wanted to complete. And then when I arrived here in July, I could see that they had started some things, but now we're going to get into the thick of it and we're going to be able to do some great capital improvements. We're even going to be able to put a ministry together. Uh, so there's nothing but good things coming out of this. Uh, so, and that was part of my sales pitch to the priest that night. I said, there's never a good time. You know, we could we could say this today. We could say it next week. We could say it three months from now. We're going to come up with the same thing. So it's got to be done. We all have needs. If we all went around our parishes and looked at what we needed, we're going to see. Yes, yeah, some of us need a new roof. Some of us need new pews. Some of us have to get a re, repave the parking lot, uh, new AC units, whatever it may be. Um, we're doing that here now. <laughs> We've had AC units that have lasted here since 1968. Oh my, oh my. That's so, insane. Yeah, so in one sense, whoever bought those and put them in, put in real good products. <laughs> so, but now, now it's time. So you can see um, how Catholic strong, strong can help something like that. So I'm very pleased with it. Um, I thought we did a great job. I met actually a few people uh, that were working with Katie at, at that time. Uh, and they all had great enthusiasm. And I think once everybody kind of got on board and they could see the good that it could do for their parish and how it can help the diocese, I think it became much smoother. And yeah. uh, people were starting to buy in. Oh, absolutely. And Katie, you know, there was something that came up during that time period um, that I really liked. So we have the we have the weekly collection, right? That's a, a typical collection. Yeah, that's your we know that as part of our Catholicism, you know, there is a, there is a, you know, one of the tenets is to be charitable and then we should support not only our church, but the work that our church does in our local parishes. And that's the, so that's the weekly collection. And then the, the annual collection is a lot of what our social services are. It's, I'd say probably 65, 70% social services. And then there's money that goes towards Hispanic ministry, black Catholic ministry, vitality, uh, healthcare services. Um, the, not the communications department. We never get any of the money, uh, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. The, um, <laughs> and then, um, and then vocations, of course. So that's, yeah. that's sort of the annual one. But then when we had this capital campaign, I don't know who it was that came up with this term or who, who told it to us. But we were having a, we were trying to figure out how to pitch 
the the concept to parishioners to to sort of to sort of you know get on board with it from a from a faith perspective like and we realize that the the probably the most accurate way of describing it and maybe this is something you you picked up in your earlier days Katie we referred to it as sacrificial giving yep this was the gift that we knew was going to hurt it was it's not the kind of thing you put into your budget usually, although yep. my wife and I did as soon as we heard about Catholic Strong, we figured out how to budget for it. But um, yeah. but we, it was going to mean you didn't get to go to Disney. It was going to mean you cut back on whatever your vacation was. It means you maybe didn't get a car for a year because mm-hmm. instead yeah. you were going to make this sacrificial gift to your church. So number one, Katie, who came up with that term sacrificial giving? <laughs> is that is that something typical in, in your field? Yes. Um, well, at least with um, our diocesan campaigns, that was certainly something that we would, you know, mention to, to the parish and to the dioceses just to, um, you know, have them say sacrificial giving because it really is. I mean, I had somebody that uh, canceled their cable so they can make a donation that was sacrificial to them. And Um, you know, sacrificial giving is just, um, it's, it's any, any dollar amount, you know, it's not equal sacrifice. It's equal, or it's not equal giving. It's equal sacrifice, um, is one of my favorite things because, you know, somebody that gives, um, $25 that might be, um, extremely sacrificial for them with their financial, um, you know, circumstances. And then somebody that could give, um, you know, $2,500, and that's sacrificial for them. So um, it's, I started in St. Louis back in 2014, and, and that was the first time I heard that term. Wow. Well, it's a brilliant term because it really does tie everything up in a, in a nice little bow. Yeah. So, so that when people do say, and on, I mean, I, and I'm not criticizing anyone who says that, oh, my goodness, I can't believe we're going to do this. This is going to be so difficult. Yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. And lean in lean into that. It's going to be difficult for the sure. person asking. It's going to be difficult for the person offering, right. but that's a good difficulty. I mean, you know, you know, I kind of brought this up in my own ham fisted way earlier. Uh, so maybe father John can speak more eloquently about it, but you know, we're, we're in Lent right now. One of the three tenants of Lent is almsgiving, you know, giving back, you know, father John, can you talk a little bit about why charity is so important to our faith? and more than just the nuts and bolts of it? Well, it really helps us to focus on the other. Uh, It's easy in life to kind of get self-absorbed and what's going on with me and um, I deserve this or I need this or I want this. Um, And that comes out of Western culture too. It's part of culture. It's kind of embedded in us in some respect. And I think Jesus going out into the desert Uh, reminds us of leaving that stuff behind. You go in, it's just you and the Lord. Uh, You don't bring any water. You don't bring any food. You don't bring any extra clothes. You don't bring any camping gear. You just kind of go in to this barren place to be present with the Lord. And in those things, the most important that comes out of that is your own relationship with him, but also how that relationship is lived out. Uh, And that relationship is lived out because love in itself, in its very core, is sacrificial. So as Katie mentioned, sacrificial giving, yes, it's a beautiful term and a slogan, right, to use, but it has to mean something in here uh, for the other. And that's what love is. It's sacrificial in nature, what I can give to someone else. And that comes in all different forms, listening to them, being present, uh, praying with them, but also meeting their other needs if they are needy. You know, the Christian community saw this in the early church. If you read Acts chapter 5, now I'm not sure if we can go back to that exact model, but they shared everything in common because they gave and they saw the beauty and the common good, uh, and they gave of their own hearts. They weren't forced to give. They were simply asked, and they gave. So, I think that imagery, that model, that meaning has to be true in us, whether we're giving to the parish in the ordinary income, whether we're giving to a campaign that can help keep the structure and the vital workings of the church going, uh, and 
for most of all to those who are in need. So I love giving back to the parish. I love giving to the capital campaign, but I love giving to House of Charity the most because I know that that's actually helping someone who might be desperate. See, uh, the parish is going to survive. Uh, even when the ordinary income drops a little bit, it eventually goes back. Um, if uh, Catholic Strong maybe kind of goes a little down for a little bit, you know, it'll level off. We'll get what we need. But House of Charity has a special place because, you know, some child who needs to get an education is being taken care of, especially if it's a disabled uh, child or handicapped in any way. Um, we know that people who are searching for work and they can't get it, they can come through Catholic Charities. House of Charity supports that. So it's putting people to work. It's feeding people, uh, visiting the sick, uh, taking care of the, the needy and the hungry. Um, I'm sorry I went off on a spiel, but that's our alms giving to them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. It's, you, you brought that up and well, it's not funny. It's, it's ironic. Um, so over the past couple of weeks, I've been working with a reporter, a great reporter for the Courier Post in Cherry Hill, uh, a woman by the name of uh, Phaedra Trethan, who was doing a story on Catholic charities uh, in Camden, actually more accurately in Atlantic City. And um, they, she did this great story on this family that was supported by Catholic charities with funding that came directly from the House of Charity. Uh, it's the Johnson family. Um, Danelle Johnson is the father, and he was out of work, had led a difficult life, but was on the right path. His, um, his son and his son's mother and he were together as a single unit and had moved into the Atlantic City area. Actually, hadn't even moved into the Atlantic City area, had made, uh, but were planning on it and got in contact with Catholic Charities. Within hours, Catholic Charities was able to set them, so set them up with living space, good living space, um, food, and t the son has a terrible medical condition, which is, is quite debilitating for him. And he needs to receive his medicine via um, his medicine has to be constantly refrigerated. So they were able to come up with a system where they were going to be able to get the, the I mean, obviously, this family doesn't have a car, not obviously, but they don't have a car. Um, they um, but they had to get his medicine and it had to be refrigerated. So they came up with a system for how they were able to get the medicine from I think I came from CVS. Um, back to their house and into their storage facility. And it was it was all Catholic Charities doing it sort of on the fly. The case manager realized just what the level of importance was to, to be able to get this done. And the money all came from donations to uh, the House of Charity. It was, and the reason why that money is so important, the, the money, that, particularly for Catholic Charities, is that's unrestricted money. It's, it's money that they can use in any way they, they see fit. You know, a lot of money they get, you know, Catholic Charities gets funding from a lot of government ent entities uh, for certain programs, very certain programs, and that money can only be used for those programs. So this kind of a situation where someone literally just calls up and is on, you know, debtor's door is an area where Catholic Charities can really make a difference. So with the interview with that family, that, that the, the, the father is now in a much better position, the mother's in a much better position, and the son is, he was... We did a Zoom interview, and you can hear him running around in the background. So he's doing very well too. So, so, and that not that would not they had, they were they had been searching for weeks for some opportunity, and somebody mentioned Catholic Charities in Atlantic City, and it just got the ball rolling. And now they are doing a hundred times better because somebody in the diocese of Camden gave money to the House of Charity, which made something like that possible, and that family could not be more in love with Catholic Charities and the case managers at Catholic Charities. I, you know, I talk to a lot of clients on a regular basis, you know, as I support Catholic Charities for a variety of things. I've never heard a family more in love with, with what they saw, what they experienced by, by working with Catholic Charities. So it's it a might, wonderful thing. Like stories like that really resonate with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it touches their hearts. Uh, and, and, and they even, you know, might recall some of their own experiences if they may have been struggling at some point. And that really helps people uh, to give of themselves. Uh, 
whether it's monetarily or even presence or helping at the actual places that where people uh, need to volunteer. Um, and I, I think House of Charity tugs on people's heartstrings more than any of the other asks, to be honest. Yeah, with. I agree. I, as you've, you've just nailed uh, the next question I was going to ask Katie, which was to talk about our secret weapon most years. Our secret weapon is the uh, famous House of Charity video that's produced oh, yeah. uh, to, to kick off each new House of Charity season. Um, so I, I've been working on them for like the last five years, but um, I really only handle one small element of it. Katie, you're the one that actually gets to, to put the director's cap on and really do a lot of great work. So yeah. How have you enjoyed the last two years of uh, producing the House of Charity video? Oh, my goodness. So first of all, I'd have to give a huge shout out to Syndicate. To Syndicate. Um, they are fantastic at, um, you know, the interviewing pieces and the filming. They just have such a uh, an eye for um, making these you know, look so pretty and flow so well, because especially for this particular uh, video, our, our theme is Faces of Hope. So we decided to interview a lot of different people. I think at least um, 13, 14 people <coughs> have, you know, that number of uh, interviews. Um, you have to kind of figure out how those flow together because you obviously need to have such a, um, or a certain length of a, of a video. So parishes could share it at mass. Um, so it was really interesting to see how that all came together, but I love it because I, I get to meet so many different people, people that are either, you know, supporting the house of charity or have been supported by the house of charity staff members. And this year in particular was great because I got to meet a lot of them and, um, hear how that, or what the house of charity means to them. So I, Love it. And I'm out there meeting with everybody and it's, it's fun. Yeah. This year's was unique because uh, in typical years, as, as father John knows, um, you know, it was in pre pandemic years, it was always very focused on the client. So we would find, I don't, and I, it was always somewhat miraculous when we get these stories, but these amazing stories of clients who had been supported by the funding of the house of charity. I mean, just, Beautiful stories, truly beautiful stories. This year, however, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that because we couldn't go visit any of the clients, certainly not with a camera crew and everything. And we were very careful not to you know, spread germs and, and whatnot. So you guys came up with the, the Faces of Hope program and said, in which case, for one of the few times we've done this, where we really focused on the caregivers, the people who are going out amongst us, being missionary disciples and meeting the people where they are. So yeah, it's an, it's typically a seven to eight minute video, but you ended up being able to figure out a way of jamming 13 different uh, talking heads in there. And there were just some great conversations about, you know, what the support of Catholic charities meant to them as people who were providing yeah. support to so many other people. Oh yeah. You know, I, I always enjoy it. Actually, the one my favorite ones are always the ones related to vocations. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love the Catholic Charities ones, but the, I work with the Catholic Charities people all the time. So a lot of times I, I knew what that story was. The vocations folks, I, I never I don't I'm not as entwined with the, the vocations group. Yeah. And uh, so hearing about, you know, these different, you know, the, what the seminarian stories are for for becoming, you know, coming to the priesthood or what you know longtime priests are which is what we did this year you had a lot of interviews with including a couple of retired priests about you know what it meant to to know that the the catholic faithful in south jersey were supporting vocations and yeah. how, how meaningful it was to them to know that they had this opportunity because of something like happy charities oh absolutely and father father vince guest actually had a great interview so i'm excited to share more of it because obviously we can only do like little snippets of it um, because we have so much content that we weren't able to share, we're definitely going to utilize our social media and our, our new YouTube channel. So I'm looking forward to showing his interview because it was really, uh, that was a great one for sure. Talking about vocations and, uh, you know, Sacred Heart Camden. It was great. And where can people go to, to learn more about House of Charity on social media? Oh, yeah. They can go to um, HOC. Actually, hold on. <laughs> It's no, so no. funny. I, I don't know it by heart, which is bad. 
No, it's not. It's just I, when we created the Camden Diocese one, we were very smart. We got lucky because we we created all of ours years ago when social media was still like slightly less uh, um, everywhere as it is now. Where we were able to secure Cam- at Camden Diocese on every social media platform, you know, <laughs> made life a little easier. So, what's what's yours? It's House of Charity D O C. Uh, on Facebook. Yeah, that's on Facebook. And what what is it on YouTube? Is it the same thing? I'm trying uh, to yeah. recall. Okay. Who whatever genius put together your your YouTube channel it was very smart to make sure that they uh, they were the same. Yes, listeners, that was me. I was cough, cough, Mike Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you're you know that's some, it's so it was so great to hear you talk about that because that's something we've been wanting to do for years, and we really just didn't have the platform and the time to do it, which to expand on what was in the house of charity video because it is only eight minutes but you know this year where you talk to so many different people uh now you're going to be able to create these like minute two minute vignettes with yeah. all of these folks that I, I think people are going to really enjoy seeing so they'll get a, a fuller appreciation of what, how um how each of these people has been positively impacted by the support to house of charity oh absolutely the uh you know something else you know since we're on sort of how to handle things in pandemic times you even had to rethink what you did for the benefactors dinner each year you uh the diocese has always been so kind to uh say thank you to the to the benefactors uh major donors to to a variety of our different campaigns but this year we we couldn't have a dinner yeah that was really sad that was sad, you know. Um, it's always nice to get together and to be able to thank everybody, you know, that donates to not only the House of Charity, but to the diocese as a whole. Um, and I know Bishop truly enjoys that that dinner as well. So um, we kind of talked about what the best course of action would be during a pandemic. And um, we ended up doing a video with Bishop where he just expressed his his gratitude to all the benefactors. And we sent it to everybody via email and we put it up on, um, I want to say, um, we put it up on YouTube. Um, so it was, you know, unfortunate we couldn't meet with people in person, but um, I think Bishop did a, a beautiful And I know a lot of people appreciated that, you know, especially during a time where um, we all understand we can't we can't be together. Um, yeah. So, but that's actually been a hallmark of the at least in the times that I've worked with the development department is um, they're always very generous in their their praise and thanks to the donors. I know you guys send out a lot of letters only mostly because I get the chance to edit a bunch of them um, to the donors every year, thanking them for their support. And then you have the benefactors dinner, and you also make a point certainly not as much. In, in pandemic times, but I know Katie, you and your predecessor, I've always done great work in making sure you get out to the parish too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorite parts. I, I love meeting with the parishes, the pastors, the volunteers. So, um, and, and, and it's hard because there's, you know, 63 parishes. So um, I can't get to everybody, but I do my best to, to get out as much as I possibly can, especially if, um, you know, they, they need my help. Um, during COVID uh, times and um, I feel like with this new campaign and the um, lack of attendance due to the restrictions, I think a lot more um, pastors need that extra um, assistance to kind of strategize how we can continue to fundraise, even if people aren't together in the pews um, like we're used to. uh, Uh, I'm assuming that uh, fundraising is not its own course in the seminary. No, uh, you know, I was very naive when I was a seminary, and I thought all I was going to do is preach, teach, <laughs> and administer the sacraments. Uh, and you enter into this world, and yes, it is those things, but it's a whole lot of other things, and it increases when you become a pastor, because then you got to become <laughs> you got to become a magician, a politician, a court jester, <laughs> uh, a business manager. Uh, you know, a salesman, you got to become all these things all at once. Uh, I'll share a funny story with you, though. I got a glimpse of this almost immediately after seminary. It was probably two years later, three years later. I was stationed at St. Joe's Woodstown in St. Anne's Elmer, and they were merging with Holy um, Holy Name of Jesus in Mullica Hill, which became um, the Catholic community of, uh, not Christ our light, of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. 
So the pastor says, I'm going to cover Woodstown. You're going to go to Elmer and you're going to give the spiel there. Because typically it's the pastor who gives the spiel. You yeah. go, I, here I went to every mass and I did it. Even though I wasn't celebrating the mass, I went and did the whole intro before the video and afterwards. So I'm a rookie priest, basically. I'm like, you want me to go there and ask them for money? He's like, yeah, yeah, uh, I'll show you how to do it, he says. The problem was St. Anne's Elmer was going to close in six months. So now I had to go and ask these people to make their goal and they were going to close six months later. So a week later, I went back to him and I said, I, I think it's better you go there, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you could put out the fire. You know their history better than me. I was only there a couple months. Yeah. And he says, no, you're going to go there. So <laughs> I had to go. And uh, believe it or not, I pulled at their heartstrings about the poor and the needy. And I even brought up some of our own community members, obviously not by name, but people that we reached out to and love and support, that there are many others like that. So I said, yes, you might be angry. You might be upset. You might have terrible, you know, all those kind of terrible feelings that are going on in you. But I need you to focus on those people. Like, so this time we did Faces of Hope. I tried to get them to focus on real people in my talk. And uh, by some miracle, St. Anne's Elmer made the goal. Um, and I felt really proud of myself until one day I was in the chapel praying and I heard a voice say to me, you had nothing to do with that. That was all me. And it was like a thunderbolt from the Lord. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It was all you. I just happened to be the mouthpiece uh, that did it. And I'll, big kudos out to all of those former folks of St. Anne's Elmer. They took the high road knowing that their parish would be closed. Yeah, they merged, but they were kind of far from Woodstown and Mullikill. It was difficult for many of them to kind of get up to those places. Uh, but they they met they met the, the challenge of the Lord because they knew that they were helping their uh, brothers and sisters who were in need. And well, that, that, is, that, mo that has moved me. In the remain all this part of my priesthood, I keep remembering them uh, when it's my turn to uh, give sacrificial gifts. You know, that's wonderful to hear. And I'll, I'll tell you that um, in, the, in the early days of this podcast, I used to bring up Elmer all the time because I was born in Elmer and my parents were married, as a matter of fact, at St. Anne's in Elmer. Um, uh, so Elmer is one of those places that I absolutely, it's, 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 this, it's this beautiful little farm community in South yeah. Jersey uh, that I still like when I'm having a bad day, I just drive through Elmer and it makes me feel better because it's just reminds me of the good old days. But it, it doesn't surprise me at all that the people of Elmer would, would absolutely do that because that's, the people I remember from my my very young youth is that they were salt of the, salt of the earth types who yeah. wanted to help their neighbor. You know, I'm a city boy, so <laughs> I got stationed at a uh, you know in a farming community, and it, Katie, it only has one light in the whole town. Really? Yeah, right past Route 40, and I think that's either Main or Broad that cuts across yeah, where that little right. deli is, right on the corner. Yeah. Uh, well, I got new, you know, yeah, that, that's now Dodge's Market, and it has some of the best food in South Jersey. I, I oh, recommend going there someday. Yeah, yeah, they reopened it a few years ago. Sorry to make this about Elmer, New Jersey, folks, but if you yeah. want to go to one of the best little tiny mom-and-pop restaurants in South oh, Jersey, great. you go to uh, Dodge's Market in Elmer, New Jersey. Great food. Absolutely phenomenal food. This, this nice little, like, 100-year-old house that they converted into uh, into a little restaurant. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, uh, so Katie, if you haven't been... Uh, and in your travels around the diocese, make sure you make it to Dodgers Market and uh, in Elmer. Give them a. Oh, I absolutely will. <laughs> I absolutely will. I'm very. No, also, right up the street is the Elmer Diner, and I'll support that one too. That's another great one. To, to, yeah, uh, that is. That's also another good place. It's a good South Jersey diner. The yeah. um. So yeah, so that's you know I I hope you know as we're you know we're going to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. Um, I hope people understand that you know. Uh, Financial development like this, which is the fancy way of saying what fundraising is, um, is not, it's certainly something to, you know, get yourself comfortable with, but I don't think it's necessarily something you need to be afraid of. I, for years and years and years, until I, till Catholic Strong, quite frankly, the, the big campaign we did, I resisted all forms of supporting, and not, I mean, I always supported these things, but uh, uh, being the face of, of the ask, right? 
And then my my former parish, when I was a kid, uh, we'd moved out of Elmer and we were living in Clayton, was uh, St. Uh, St. Catherine's Church, now it's part of St. Michael the Archangel Parish. And uh, one of Katie's compatriots came to me and said uh, that the priest there was having some difficulty with um, with his ask. And she said, uh, hey, Mike, would you be up for doing the pitch? And I said, sure. Anything to support, <laughs> anything. I, would, I don't even live in Clayton. I live up the road in Glassboro now. But I said, you know what? That, if, it, if it wasn't for that parish, I would not be where I am today, both being a member of that parish and its co- companion school, St. Michael's the Archangel, where my son goes to now. And I was like, you know what? I will do whatever I can for that parish. So I did the pitch at all three masses and two of them were good. Uh, The first pitch was spectacular on Saturday night. The second pitch was a train wreck on Sunday morning. And the third (laughs) pitch Sunday after or Sunday mid morning was eh, better than the first one. Not quite as great as the the third, but, um, but but I felt so much better after it. And I gotta tell you, what I saw standing up at the front of the church, giving my my ask was in the was people nodding their heads and being interested. Um, I I had spent a lot of time writing my pitch, and only to have the pastor basically give my pitch before I got up there. So I completely had to change it on the fly oh, from, no. from the ambo, and uh, and unfortunately I didn't write it down, so it was terrible the next two days. Well, it was terrible the next morning, but but I but. They said it was really important that I did that, and they said it was successful. They said they had a they had a good they had a good Catholic strong. Be, from what not, I mean, it wasn't all me. There were other elements. So my parents ended up calling people and stuff like that. But um, but it made me happy, and I was like, you know what? That was not as scary as I thought it was going to be. So yeah, as we've talked about on the podcast before, I'm a classic introvert. Doing stuff like that is not easy for me. Um, but it was great, to, and it was wonderful when I was finally done. I was like, okay, I did something. That was nice. That's awesome. Yeah, That's it was. Um, so anyway, I, I hope people who are listening will will think about that and, and go, you know, okay, it's not that bad. So Katie, is there any, do you have any other best practices or suggestions for people before while they're thinking about this? Because I do have one more question for you afterwards. Sure. Um, you know, if you want to make a donation to the House of Charity, I would certainly suggest using our online platform. I'm definitely encouraging our parishes to to push that with their parishioners because it's just um, it's it's the easiest way at this point. You know, um, it's quicker. You know, we'll we'll receive your donations immediately and be able to process it. So um, definitely um, something I would. Katie, Katie, I had a question. Can, sure. we, can we post that link on our own website? Absolutely. Yes. All right. Because I, I want to talk to my IT guy so we get that set up. Great. Right. I don't want to spend awesome. too much time on that because this is internal stuff. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, it might help some of the other pastors in their parishes because they might not have it set up on their website. Yeah. So if somebody can help, uh, my IT guy will be here tomorrow, but we can touch base tomorrow. Perfect. All right. I love see that now. Now that it's a this podcast has been truly beneficial because now we have we've gotten a question answered. I love that. <laughs> the, um, and you know that's the truth too. You know there are traditional methods for fundraising, and then there's all these sort of digital age methods, and yeah. each one of them has their strengths and weaknesses. But I, th- I think and you might agree with this, Katie. You got to do them all, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. It's, in my line of work, it's multi-channel communications, but the truth of the matter, multi-channel fundraising is just important, just as important. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All yeah. right, Katie, now, here's the very important final question I have to ask for you. We talked about Marvel earlier in the conversation. Uh-huh. I'd led with it. Have you been watching WandaVision on Disney? Yes. Okay. Yes, That's yes, good. yes. <laughs> Have you been my 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 son and daughter? My son loves the MCU. My my wife is she can take it or leave it. At the end of the last two episodes, I think we're up to episode seven as the time we're we're recording this. Uh, they have literally been at the edge of the couch, looking over, and had been in stunned silence when the uh, the episodes end so abruptly. I I honestly I I love it. I love it, and I. I it's crazy because when you saw the first few episodes, you were trying to figure out where they were going with it, you know, and now that it's getting to that end point, it's fantastic. And the ending of the last episode was 
I know it was yeah. mind numbing. I was like, yes. I couldn't believe it. I was blown away. Father, oh, ha, so are great. you are you much of a Marvel guy, Father? Yeah, uh, I'm a fan. I'm not I'm not a real huge fanatic. I'm more <laughs> of a Lord of the Rings guy, Star Wars. Uh, those are my favorites. But uh, and I, I watched the entire Avengers series and all the, the side ones. Um, I don't get to the movies on the first day they come out, but I watch I watched them all. I thought they were well done. Uh, you know, there's a sacrificial nature to them of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody sacrificing themselves uh, and not only in that last one, but in, in all of them. So and, and that theme runs throughout even Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings. You see that like in Luke Skywalker, you see it in Frodo in the Lord of the Rings and so forth. But uh, this WandaVision, I'm going to give it a try because it's, okay. it's got me very confused. And they trapped in some different reality. Um, you know, I thought, you know, where, does it, where is it in the timeline? I thought the one guy was dead. You know, the one guy who's got the diamond in his head. I thought yeah. he was dead. Now he's alive. So did it happen before? Did it happen after? Where are they stuck? Uh, did they create their own reality to, the, you know, shield themselves? from something, but I'll give it a look. You should. I love it. You should. Highly yes. recommend. I, it's definitely worth it. I recommend it. And if if you were talking about Star Wars, there's always the Mandalorian on Disney Plus as well, oh. which I've loved every second of. A plus, A plus. Oh yeah. That's another, oh, that's such a great show. So to all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this little moment of, uh, of pop culture as well. But uh, Katie, Father John, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, coming on board. Uh, if you don't, you haven't seen Katie yet out and about, you will soon enough because um, she'll be uh, out to the parishes for the next year with Faces of Hope. And if you ever have the chance to go to a parish in Cherry Hill, I certainly recommend Christ Our Light in Cherry Hill with Father John Picnic. It's a great parish, wonderful music there. And uh, they've been very, very supportive of everything the diocese has ever asked them to do. So that's that's a great thing as well. So everybody... Thanks for listening, and hopefully I'll have a host join me next week, and uh, we'll talk to you all next time. Take it easy, everybody.